While the first photographs of the moon were actually taken back in the mid 19th century, the first photographs taken on the moon weren't taken until 1969. NASA's got that sweet, sweet government money so they could afford to take those images on Hasselblad. Turns out, these were some of the most iconic images taken in the 20th century. In this video, we're going to talk about the time NASA formed a tag team with Hasselblad. Look away, flat earthers. It's going to get ugly. Welcome back to Overexposed, where I actually haven't recorded a video in so long, I got a new microphone. Although NASA wouldn't get those first images on the moon until the summer of 69, NASA's relationship with Hasselblad came way before that. All the way back in 1962, during the Mercury program, NASA had a prospective astronaut named Walter Shearer. And not only did this guy like to fly rockets, but he also liked to take pictures, and he owned a Hasselblad 500C with that fancy schmancy Carl Zeiss 80mm 2.8 lens. The one that I'd give my rock kidney for. Knowing that his Hasselblad took super dope images, Walter went to NASA and said, hey, why don't we stop using these trashy cameras to take pictures of space? Why don't we use these Hasselblad cameras? They're really great. And NASA said, we've got plenty of cash. Sounds like a good idea. Before NASA made the switch to Hasselblad, they used a lot of other cameras. Some of those cameras that NASA used before moving to Hasselblad were, for example, the Ranger program. This was an early mission that NASA wanted to use to photograph the moon's surface to, to kind of get ready for the Apollo missions. And during that mission, NASA used the Westinghouse Electric Corporation's electric camera. This was a camera that came fitted with a wide angle lens, and it was specific specifically designed to take pictures of the lunar surface. And then there was the Surveyor Program, which was another one of those unmanned pre-Apollo missions to the moon. This one actually soft landed on the moon and used a wide variety of cameras. On Surveyor 1, for example, they used a proprietary camera de developed by JPL, which is Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That's an in-house NASA thing, and that camera combination consisted of a stereo camera and a television camera. And then also, the early Gemini missions used a modified 70mm film camera. They mounted this thing in the cockpit, kind Kind of like a GoPro and took some pictures of Earth. After trying out all those other cameras and realizing they kind of sucked, NASA held a rigorous selection process and just like their boy Walter told them, Hasselblad was the best. And it was the best for a number of reasons. Number one, due to its simplicity. They are relatively simple cameras. They're also extremely durable. NASA thought that they would potentially be able to withstand the forces that would be applied to them on these very difficult missions and the cameras were reliable. Because at the time, it cost literally thousands of dollars per ounce to ship things to space. As for the camera development, just like me at the start of every new year, the cameras got on a weight loss program. NASA tried to cut down the weight on the Hasselblad 500Cs as much as possible. NASA got rid of the leather covering, the auxiliary shutter, the mirror mechanism, the reflex mirror, and the viewfinder. NASA had a much, oh, hey baby, this is Luna. You picked a good video to show up in Luna. NASA had new film magazines created for these special space edition Hasselblad 500s. These magazines would hold 70 exposures instead of the usual 12. And finally, they got away with all the sexy polished aluminum and chrome on the outside of the Hasselblad cameras and painted them just a flat matte. They did this specifically because it would minimize the reflections in the window of the orbiter. You're, you're being very distracting. These new heavily modified Hasselblad cameras would first find their way into duty in 1962 in the Mercury 8 mission. And as luck would have it, our boy Walter had reached his dream of becoming an astronaut. And in his six orbits around the Earth, he would capture extremely high quality images. And at this point, NASA's photo department started to grow and grow, and the partnership with Hasselblad became more intense. Hasselblad kept working on those modified 500C cameras, and they found their way into service on a number of subsequent missions. And during those missions, they would experiment. They would try different constructions of the cameras, different lenses, different combinations, dialing things in just so. And it proved to be quite the challenge for Hasselblad. As I said, it was thousands of dollars per ounce to send things to space, so NASA was always pushing Hasselblad to drop the weight on the cameras. And they did. They kept making the cameras lighter and lighter as time went on. And this was a pretty impressive feat. Folks were really surprised by the high quality images that came back from the space missions. And it's easy to forget about the extreme tolerances that these cameras had to live up to. These cameras had to work in extremely high temperatures, and they also had to work in extremely low temperatures in the vacuum of space. The cameras had to deal with zero gravity and a number of other unknown problems. You know, in photography, a lot of times we think about the decisive moment and how you can't go back in time and recreate a moment. But, and if you think about it, these Hasselblad cameras were tasked with capturing billion dollar images, just gobs of money. Uh, put forth to get these images so they had to work perfectly every single time and they did for the most part it would be that mission where the eagle spacecraft would land on july 20th 1969 on the surface of the moon buzz lightyear would speak his famous words or was that neil armstrong and these would signify humanity's first steps off of our own planet the camera that neil armstrong would take with him when he disembarked the eagle spacecraft was an hdc 
or a Hasselblad data camera. The camera would be fitted with a Rizzo plate and a Carl Zoss Biogon 50 millimeter f5.6 lens. So as we know, the Boca was probably not that great, but that's okay. They had brought with them a second Hasselblad setup. This one was an HEC or Hasselblad electric camera. And on this camera, it would come fitted with a Carl Zoss 80 millimeter 2.8 lens, which would be Boca-licious. The only caveat was the HEC camera would only be used to take pictures from the Eagle spacecraft itself. And if you can believe it, the HDC, that Hasselblad data camera, had never been tested in space before. Talk about pressure. These chumps were walking around on the surface of the moon with these cameras, taking pictures, not even sure if they were going to work. Which, to be fair, is mostly how I live my life. Another really cool facet to this story is the Hasselblad cameras were actually left on the moon along with their Carl Zeiss lenses. After the boys got done doing some photography on the moon, the camera was were hoisted up by a line into the Eagle spacecraft. The film magazines were taken out of the cameras, and just like you or I would discard a banana peel, the Hasselblad cameras and Carl Zeiss lenses were thrown away carelessly on the surface of the moon, where they remain today. Their spaceship had to obviously launch back off the surface of the moon, and every ounce helps preserving fuel, making sure they made it back out of the moon's gravity, and they could get back on their way back to Earth. But at some point, you know, someone's going to go back, and they're going to get those cameras, and they're going to be worth all the money in the world. <laughs> During their little photo walk on the moon, the boys managed to capture 842 stunning images. And while the majority of these images were taken on the surface of the moon, quite a few of them were also taken from the lunar module. Another thing that's worth talking about here is the film that was used. While they were walking around on the moon, they were actually shooting a special version of Kodak Ektachrome. Believe it or not, Eastman Kodak specifically formulated this version of Ektachrome to be used in space. What made the film so good for use in space wasn't that it was resistant to lasers or Death Star rays or anything like that. It was a special layer that Kodak had applied to the film to make it more resistive of radiation. Additionally, the film was packaged in a special container to keep it safe from the temperature fluctuations in the vacuum of space. The film was also coated with a layer of anti-static material that would keep it safe from any little static discharges that may happen, so they didn't get those weird lightning bolts on their film, I guess. And if you're wondering, the film was rated at an ISO 160. And who did NASA trust to develop these images? Well, they did it themselves. Yes, that's right. NASA trusted themselves to develop the images from the Apollo 11 mission at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And I'm just imagining those poor guys with their beakers and mixing the chemicals and whatnot and the sheer amount of terror they must have felt as they were getting ready to put those images into the development tanks. I mean, you talk about a screw up. Like I said, billion dollar images, and they're developing them themselves. The images were developed using traditional darkroom techniques, and they were printed out on glossy paper. The images were then scanned and digitized. That way they could be analyzed by researchers all over the world, and we can still look at those images today. And like any good photographers, NASA did everything they could to protect and preserve the negatives from these shoots. But that wasn't before they sent the negatives to Kodak for examination. And while it's cool that they used Hasselblad cameras to take pictures on the moon the one time on Apollo 11, and what's even cooler is that there were actually six total manned missions to the surface of the moon, and Hasselblad cameras were used on all of those missions. It's estimated that the total number of images collected by the Apollo program in its short run from 1969 to 1972 is about 13,000. Photographs taken on the Apollo 11 mission are some of the most iconic images in human history. Heck, they may be the most iconic images in human history. And they provided us with a wealth of information about the lunar surface and what Earth looked like from outer space. And culturally, these images captured the imagination of the world. Um, just a really captivating time to be alive. And hopefully we have more moments like that to come in the future. And with NASA's recent Artemis mission, looks like we may be on the path to do just that. Hey, let me know in the comments what camera you think NASA would take with them to the moon today. Because they may be faced with just that decision in the next few years. Why don't you take a look at this video where I talk about the film that Kodak developed with the United States government that helped kill thousands of people. But as always guys, thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Oh, <laughs>